Good morning. I'm going to make a short video with uh, some ideas and some background to Henry James and his short story, The Real Thing. This is a famous quotation from Henry James. We work in the dark. We do what we can. We give what we have. The we here is art, the artists, the power of writers, the power of painters, the power of sculptors. Our doubt is our passion, he says, and our passion is our task. The rest is the madness of art. So this gives you a little bit of an insight into the kind of deep thinking that James did uh, about his work and about his life as an artist. Um, James himself is a very interesting man. He lived for a really long time, as you can see. came from New York City, but he lived there uh, for only a few years. And when he was about five, he went to Europe, and he spent a number of years living in Europe, mainly because it was cheaper. His family had a lot of money. His father lost it all pretty early on, before James was born. He wasn't really a very good businessman. He was much more of a philosopher. He was a, a somebody who followed the Transcendentalist, which is uh, where our other story, uh, Hawthorne, comes from, and also dabbled in two or three other sort of uh, mid-19th century American movements, Fourierism and Swedenborgianism, two European philosophers, philosophies that were looking for uh, different ways to substitute themselves for Christianity. Uh, after James comes back to the United States, he stays here. He tries to go to Harvard Law. He doesn't law doesn't work for him. He tries to become a painter. That doesn't work for him. He doesn't fight in the Civil War. He has some kind of injury that keeps him out, even though he's certainly old enough to do so. But in 1869, he goes back to Europe uh, for a trip. He stays for a few years, then he comes back. And then he goes back again in 1875, and he never really comes back home after that. He makes one trip to the United States uh, in about 1904, and he writes one of his last books, The American Scene, about his tour of uh, the United States that he hasn't seen for about 30 years. The last few years of his life, he lives in England. Uh, he becomes a British citizen at the uh, outset of World War I to show solidarity with the English cause. And he dies in England in 1916, but he's buried in a family plot in Cambridge, Massachusetts. He never married. Uh, biographers have spent a lot of time thinking about his sexuality. It's fairly well established by now that he was gay and had a series of, of relationships with young men uh, for much of his later life. Uh, many of whom took advantage of him. But his major focus in his life was his art, his writing. And as you can see, he turned out a tremendous amount of work, uh, over 20 novels, 112 short stories, 12 plays. And he was always trying to figure out ways to make money from his art. Uh, this is one of his more popular stories. His novels were well received, but were never like bestsellers. So he tried to become a playwright in the 1890s, and that did not go well at all. He wrote a play called Guy Domville that's awful, and he was booed on the stage after it opened. Uh, so he tried 12 plays total in his life, but none of them were commercial successes. He was an incredible critic of uh, art and philosophy and literature, uh, wrote carloads of travel books, which are some of my, one of some of my favorites of his. He wrote three autobiographical works about himself and his family, and he was uh, widely read as a literary critic. Uh, of other artists in a period of time. And a lot of this stuff has been collected, and if you're interested in Henry James, uh, let me know, and I'll be glad to give you uh, resources for him. Uh, James is one of my favorite writers. I, I took a graduate seminar in him many, many years ago and kind of fell in love with him. I don't like all of his works, but much of his writing to me is just like the best ever. Here's some pictures of James. This is James with his father, whose name was also Henry James. Henry James wrote under the name Henry James Jr. for most of his life until his father died. Uh, this is James when he went to Harvard. Uh, this is James later in his life um, when he was a, an established writer. This is from about 1885 or so. This is the house that he lived in um, when he was in England. It's called Lamb House in Rye in Sussex. And you can still visit it. This is the study that, uh, that he wrote in. His last few novels he dictated to a secretary of his. This is one of the last portraits of James. It was done in about 1914 just before he became a British citizen. And the British loved him. He was uh, a very popular writer in England, um, but never, as I said, a terribly commercial success. He kept this beard from pretty much the time he started writing, um, after about 1869 or so, until 1899. And it wasn't until well after the death of his father that one day he decided to just shave it off and become his own person and started writing under the name Henry James. And as you can see here, his last portrait, uh, he was clean shaven. Uh, we know from James's notes and own writings on the real thing that the inspiration came from a story that George Du Maurier, a magazine illustrator, told him. 
here's a picture of Maurier, and here's some of the illustrations that he did. I've got a bunch more of these that I'll be showing you. Um, at this period of time, 19th century magazines and books were frequently illustrated, and they were illustrated very lavishly. Uh, production cost had gone way down. Uh, you had a newly literate mass circulation market in the cities, and people wanted both text and pictures, just like they do now. And so Du Maurier was, was a friend of James and was famous for being a, 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 an incredible illustrator for magazines and for books, very, very famous. And he invented um, a character called Trilby, who was a young woman who tended to dress in avant-garde, semi-masculine kinds of ways, who did all kinds of interesting things in London. And it's not a very readable book, but it's where our, our word for the Trilby hat comes from. For those of you who pay attention to those things, that's that's where the term comes from, is from this 1912, not, or I'm sorry, uh, 1888 book, uh, Trilby. But he illustrated for a magazine called Punch, which was probably the most popular magazine of its time. It still is very popular, still published in England. It's uh, it's kind of sort of like the New Yorker, but it's more of a humor magazine than a literary one. But uh, this was one of the ways that Du Maurier made his money. And of course, so the story, the real thing, concerns somebody who is a magazine and a book illustrator who also wants to be taken seriously as an artist. And of course, the monarchs come and ask to be models for his art. And there, there was a big demand for these figures uh, back then, not for the monarch specifically, but people like them, people who could be used to pose for artists who were uh, meeting this mass need for illustrated magazines and illustrated books. Um, the story that Maurier tells is the, that James takes his story from is, in fact, the same kind of thing. A couple down on their lock who, very, who once were wealthy and established high in the social class lose all their money and decide to become artist models. That's the germ of the story uh, that James writes. Here are some more illustrations of uh, Maurier's works. These were done very quickly. They were done uh, for publication in magazines, sometimes in books. So they weren't made to live forever but they were still very uh, well-received, very well-constructed pieces of art. You can kind of see here the limitations of lithography in this period. They couldn't get details as sharp and as clear as we might like. These things were done uh, in black and white, as the artist in the story tells us, and then they were uh, converted into a copper plate um, and then by a, a, a lithographer. And then they were used in books and magazines. Uh, so there's a number of, of steps involved in this process, but these are some of the printed versions. I have some cartoons here from Punch that you might find interesting. Um, they had lots of uh, cartoons about differences in social class, differences between men and women, the same kind of humor that we find in New Yorker cartoons now they had back then. And so here we see um, two different women, one overdressed, one underdressed, both talking about travel and different parts of England, and oh my God, how could you live without a dressmaker? This was past for serious humor back then. Um, here's a, another Du Maurier piece, um, and this is uh, a uh, an American woman meeting a British one, and that's kind of what you see going on in here. You see how women were dressed and portrayed in these pictures. The woman on the left, I think, always reminds me of what Mrs. Monarch must have looked like, the elbow with the orthodox crook, the thin... Uh, figure, the slim waist. This, I think, is, if this isn't Mrs. Monarch, it's somebody just like her. Okay. There's another Du Maurier piece of people eating around a table and telling stories. And as you can see, it's almost, I think we have two men and two women here. And this just gives you an idea of the, the range of, of Du Maurier's drawings. Again, he was very, very popular in this period and a, and a very well-respected artist. Magazine art, which is the stuff that he does, uh, is was very popular in the United States up through the 1950s. And I have some images here that I took from an exhibit at uh, Washington University a few years ago where they did a whole bunch of uh, covers and magazine illustrations from 1950s uh, literary fiction magazines like Look, uh, Saturday Evening Post, Cosmopolitan, back when it published fiction, um, Collier's. There were a whole bunch of these magazines that kind of went out of business in the 50s uh, and the 60s uh, as the market kind of dried up for this. But the idea of magazine illustrations and mostly for uh, showing women in different poses because women were the main consumers of this kind of fiction went on in our own country. So what Du Maurier is doing in the 1860s, 70s, and 80s is the same kind of stuff that we did in the United States up until relatively recently, maybe into your parents or your grandparents' lifetime. Certainly this is the kind of stuff I grew up with when I was a kid.
this is a, another picture from that same exhibit. This is from Cosmopolitan in 1952. And you can see how risque this is. Uh, this particular one is the shade pulled down. You see the woman is nude uh, behind it. And she's portrayed in a very, very provocative kind of pose where we see the bottom of her breast, but we don't see her face. Um, and we don't see the rest of her figure. So, again, the, the point of this is that it's the same kind of genre that Du Maurier is working in. Okay. Here's the last of these, and this was uh, both uh, a short story illustration for a magazine. It was also used, actually, as a piece of poster art by American Airlines. And so you see the stewardess, back when they were called stewardesses, you see the sole child traveler bringing a doll back from overseas, and she's got a, a comic book or something in her hand. Um, and so this was the kind of sort of crossover difference between magazine art done for illustrating short stories and commercial art, the art that was used in, um, in advertising uh, in the period. So this might give you a little bit of a sense that, of the world that we inhabited up until relatively recently, where this kind of, of um, magazine art done by hand, done by illustrators, you know, in, in oils or in acrylics or some other kind of medium or even colored uh, chalk, which I think actually is how this is done, uh, and then converted into something that could be printed and distributed in a magazine. The worlds are not that uh, much different. And we still, if you start looking at these pictures, you still get the same idea of, you know, sexual identity and gender roles and the same kind of sort of things that, that go on in um, Henry James's time, both then and now still occur. Here's some things to think about. This is the last slide. Um, who exactly is the real thing? The title of the story kind of indicates that the monarchs might be the real thing for the wrong reason, that they, they occupy so much space, they're so done, they're so perfect, that the artist doesn't have any room to work it. So they might be too real for him to work from. And he's always contrasting the monarchs with his models, Miss Cherm and Orante, who are, are much lower social class folks, but he's able to use them to represent a type that he can then uh, create with his uh, with pen and ink. Is the artist the real thing? And one of my um, discussion board questions for this is, is this guy really a good artist? Is he as good an artist as he thinks he is? And so I offer some evidence in that discussion board for a different view that perhaps he's not the great artist that he thinks he is. So you can take a, a a look at that and see if that intrigues you or not. Is the art he creates the real thing? It's magazine art, it's disposable, it's meant to be consumed in the same way that Du Maurier's art is. Could be a very good quality, but it's not quite the same thing that we hang up in a museum wall. Or are the monarchs the real thing because their marriage is so real? They're utterly devoted to each other. And in fact, of all the marriages that we've seen in the course so far, it may very well be that the monarchs have the ideal marriage, uh, a real meeting of two minds. There's about a 10-year age difference between the two. These guys were very poor after used to being pretty wealthy, and they're completely out of place. Socially, they're, they're not in the right place anymore. And all this would threaten a marriage. It certainly does in Leroy and Norma genes. If you go back to Shiloh, Blake's marriage in the 548 is a disaster. We've, we've had other marriages in here that are just lousy. But this may be the most positive image of marriage that we have uh, the whole course. Another thing to think about social class, the monarchs were in the army. They were in a social class above the artist before the story begins. They've fallen from that status and they have to go apply for work. And Major Monarch even talks about this and says, I would be anything. I'd haul a coal bucket. I'd be a messenger. I'd do any of these things. In fact, um, he's willing to do almost any job, but because of the constraints of social class, nobody will hire him. He's too high class to do that kind of stuff. But he's not uh, sharp enough to be hired as a club secretary or any other jobs that he has. Out of the army, he really has no place. But again, that doesn't really threaten their marriage, which I think is kind of interesting. At the same time, the monarchs are above the artist. The artist, again, is a commercial guy. He's in trade, which is not a good thing, even in this period. Um, and so the monarchs have to come to him as supplicants. And so the, the normal order of things at this point is reversed. And the artist is keenly aware of this, the artist narrator in the story. And then, of course, we have the models, who one's in the uh, a cockney, low-class, working-class kind of woman, and the other's an immigrant, and the monarchs aren't quite sure what to make about them. And so much of the education that goes on in the story is of the monarchs learning kind of what the lower classes are all about, and they develop a certain kind of sympathy for, for that kind of experience. We certainly see that at the end of the story, 
when the monarchs clean up the uh, the artist studio, they, they wash his dishes, they do all that kind of stuff. And he treats them at one point kind of like servants, which is kind of interesting. So you see a lot of social class chasms and schisms in there where things are moving in a way that's not necessarily in the best interest or the heart's desire of any of the characters. Something that I'm fascinated with, but I don't really know how to describe it, is, is how art works, how do artists work. Uh, and these last two points here, what's the nature of the creative process, what's the nat nature of art, I think are questions that we all come at differently. Um, what's the difference between commercial art and fine art? What's the kind of stuff that makes it to the St. Louis Art Museum or the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York, my favorite museum, or the Uffizi? And what's the stuff that we just dispose of? And uh, there's a wonderful essay by Walter Benjamin that talks about the uh, the nature of fine art in the age of mechanical reproduction, where he says that at some point, the fact that we can reproduce images of great paintings anytime, anywhere, kind of like we can do with Google or we can carry images around on our phone, reduces in a sense their value because it used to be you had to travel to a museum and, and look at a, photo, uh, a painting or a sculpture. Now you can just call it up on your phone or you can find a book of reproductions. Uh, and consume them that way. And so he talks in there about what all this means. And he's not quite sure either, but his notion is that the more we disseminate art, the more we devalue it. And there's some of that going on in the story because the artist narrator says, I'm only doing this illustration stuff because it lets me do my fine art. But we never see him doing any fine art. He's always consumed by the immediate need to make money, kind of like Henry James was with his own writing. He was always writing, hoping he would get a breakthrough book. Uh, the artist has the same kind of problem here because his the stuff he does to make a living keeps him from doing the kind of art that he wants. He really wants to be a great artist, but his work, his lifestyle requires that he keep making magazine and book illustrations, which he knows are not as good as what he could make. It's much more commercial, like those magazine illustrations I was showing you, both Du Maurier's and the 50s ones. So, but how do we distinguish something like that? It could be quite striking, as some of those uh, images were, with the kind of art that we would say, oh, this belongs in a museum. This is clearly a work of a master. How much of that are we taught? How much of that do we apprehend just by looking at the work itself? So something to think about. <laughs> And the last thing I point out in, in here is kind of this, this idea of marriage. And as I mentioned before, the monarchs seem to have a kind of marriage <coughs> that many other characters would be envious of. And so one of the things you might want to think about uh, is exploring the marriage here. And then maybe even later when we look at the Hawthorne story, uh, to look at the marriage that we see there between Georgiana and Elmer and see if it's a marriage that's comparable or is contrastive with that of the monarchs. One last thing is this idea of the creative process. How do artists work? How do they get their inspiration? How do they maintain uh, their ability to produce certain kinds of art? How much is developed from the representing the model, him or herself, and how much of that is created in the artist's own head? As, as James says, we work in the dark, and he talks about this idea of the madness of art. And so do you see any of that in the artist in this story? Or is this guy an artist who doesn't work at that level, who's much more commercial, who's much more quotidian, uh, much more kind of a daily commercial kind of artist. And is he limited or expanded by the models that he's given? Sometimes I think that the monarchs are the real thing so much so that he realizes that he's nowhere near the kind of artist that he could be because they're fully formed. They're kind of a work of art themselves in a way that he is not and he's not capable of producing. But not every critic agrees with me. And most critics look on the monarchs as exactly as the uh, artist says they are. They limit the nature of the creative process because there's no place for the artist to work. There's nothing the artist could do to improve them. So lots to think about. Uh, there's questions of aesthetics, there's questions of social class, there's questions of marriage, and how men and women get along, and how men and women are, are talked about and represented. Uh, so much to do here in the short story. So I hope you enjoy it, and I hope you enjoy it as much as I do. I'm very much looking forward to your discussion board post. Thank you very much.